started. And welcome everyone to Accelerate Your City Fortifying Regional EV Charging Infrastructure. This webinar is part of a three-part series sponsored by, the, by Smart Columbus and the Electrification Coalition. Can you guys see my slides advancing? Okay, great. Um, so Accelerate Your City is part of a digital capstone celebrating the uh, completion of the Smart Columbus Electrification Program. Um, today joining us to talk about EV charging infrastructure. Can you tell you, do you see slides advancing? I'm sorry, everyone. Sorry, I, I can see the title slide, um, but I don't see them advancing. Sorry about that. Here we go. I can advance them. Can you see the pink slide now? Sorry, you're not screen sharing now. <laughs> oh, cool. No. Now I can see the pink slide. Now I can I can see the pink slide. I don't know if you want to try to toggle between them. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Technical difficulties as we navigate Zoom life. Um, but this webinar is part of a three-part series sponsored by the Electrification Coalition and Smart Columbus as we come to the conclusion of the grant program sponsored by the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, uh, which was awarded to Columbus as the winner of the Smart City Challenge. Uh, to learn more about our program, we invite you to visit Accelerate Your City, which is a digital capstone of that program, where you can learn more about all the many aspects of the program, some of which we'll be talking about today. Today, we'll specifically be talking about how we fortified EV charging infrastructure in the Columbus region, and joining us to talk about that are Natalia Swalnick, from the Electrification Coalition, Bud Broughton with the City of Columbus, Scott Jaffe with GPD Group, and Mark Barrett with AEP Ohio. Thanks everyone for joining us for today's session. With that, I'll turn it over to Natalia. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Natalia Swalnick. I'm the Senior Director of Electric Vehicle Programs at the Electrification Coalition. Um, and it is um, a, a nice bookend to this program to be able to participate in this webinar to really celebrate the successes of the Smart Columbus program um, on behalf of the Electrification Coalition. As I'll discuss in a later slide, we actually were involved in um, the Smart Cities Challenge pre-award selection. So it's just really exciting to see how the program has transitioned from the conceptualization stages to you know, presenting on the conclusions, findings, and successes today. So in case you do not know the Electrification Coalition, we are a nonprofit organization based in Washington, DC. And our mission is to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. And we do this to reduce the national security, economic, and environmental threats caused by our nation's oil dependency. So we do this through a myriad of programs, uh, one of which being uh, Smart Columbus, um, but we also have worked on um, and led electric vehicle accelerator programs in Northern Colorado, Rochester, New York. We have um, pioneered uh, this EV rental car concept uh, with Drive Electric Orlando that we're also looking to grow in other states. And we have worked with cities around the United States um, through the American Cities Climate Challenge and through the electric vehicle, uh, the Climate Mayor's EV Purchasing Collaborative, which is a portal to help uh, cities electrify their fleets through parity of vehicle offerings, easier procurement, and technical assistance designed to advance electric vehicles. We also have um, a state level electric vehicle policy accelerator where we work in five key states. Uh, those are North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Nevada. And finally, we are really taking our light duty work um, um, over the road with our freight electrification pilot. So we are working in the commercial sector uh, with select fleets to help them electrify their medium and heavy duty uh, 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 fleet operations in the commercial sector, as well as the associated charging infrastructure needs there as well. Next slide. 
this slide um, really exemplifies why the electrification coalition exists and how our motivation is national and energy security. So the big picture is that 92% of the United States transportation needs are powered by oil, which really uh, means that we are largely dependent on a resource with volatile pricing and the US spends $80, million, $80 billion per year to defend our interests uh, both in the US but, but abroad to make sure that we have access to the fuel that we need. And uh, not only does that mean that we sometimes have to align our national security interests with others that don't share those, those same values, but we're also dependent on a source that is um, leading uh, global emissions. And so if you look at the total US greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector um, in 2018, you can see that transportation is the largest slice of the pie accounting for 28% of all um, emissions um, according to the Energy Independence, um, Energy Information Administration. And so that really drives home the reason for our work, making sure that we are diversifying the fuels um, on which we are dependent, um, but also making sure that our national um, economic and energy alliances are things that are going to, to benefit US interests. Next slide, please. So to bring us to uh, the, the very beginning of our story, um, the Electrification Coalition was involved in the US Department of Transportation Smart Cities Challenge. And so we um, helped lead the selection team for Paul G. Allen Family F Philanthropies um, around the country. And this is a map of where um, the different cities, I believe there are seven, 77, if you look at the fourth box down, uh, 77 different cities that applied to be the smart city. Um, obviously, Columbus was uh, victorious in this challenge. And we joined the implementation team for fleet electrification, charger deployment, and consumer adoption once um, Columbus was selected as a finalist. We um, hired local staff and worked daily within the Smart Columbus program, even officing um, with the, the folks that you, you see on the call today to really ingratiate ourselves into the project, contribute to the program goals, and advance electrification um, for all of the different market segments um, that were targeted through the Smart Columbus program. So um, I will let the team take it away. And um, thank you again for, um, you know, a great three years uh, working on this project and we're excited um, about all the uh, terrific results that the program has accomplished. Okay, thanks, Natalia. Um, yeah, my name is Bud Broughton again. And I am an electrical engineer for the City of Columbus, uh, Division of Design and Construction, and I'm on loan to Smart Columbus here for the past few years. So appreciate the opportunity to kind of share out what we've been doing here uh, in the electrification realm here in the past few years. So um, if you look at the next slide, you can see that everything was broken down from the very beginning into five different priorities. The grantors wanted to know what we were gonna do in each of these areas. So we set all these goals. Uh, some of them we met, some of them we, we uh, fell a little short, uh, but there were a lot of lessons learned along the way. And so that's what we wanna do is try to go over some of those lessons learned as we, as we share this out. First priority there was of course decarbonization of the grid, you know, a big part of um, Ohio's electrical grid is, is coal. So, uh, and working with our partners in a big way there, uh, American Electric Power and others, such as our own division of power, we've, we've uh, been working way uh, at that and had a lot of success stories there. Uh, fleet electrification, as far as the uh, city goes, we purchased 200 of our own light duty vehicles over the past few years. A lot of successes there. You may have seen us talk about that in a previous webinar. I think that's recorded in case you wanted to kind of follow up with that. Uh, then our US DOT portion of this grant is the priority three that did involve six autonomous electric vehicles as well as 50 electric bikes. And the, uh, the big portion of our program here, uh, number four, we have also in another webinar, if you wanna follow up on that one, on the consumer adoption of electric vehicles that goes into tremendous detail about the uh, the um, many projects and initiatives that we, we uh, helped to be able to, uh, to reach our goals there of 1.8% adoption of new electric vehicles in the region. And then uh, finally, what we're gonna be talking about today, the uh, charging infrastructure 
goal of 925 new electric vehicle chargers installed by 2020. Kind of want to break that down into the various factions of, of fleet, you know, public charging, uh, multi-unit dwelling charging, you know, residential type charging, and, and then workplace. So kind of give you an update on all that. Um, next slide there. If you look at the, uh, the biggest portion of our program here, the goal of uh, reaching the 1.8% that I mentioned, um, our grantor looked at this baseline number that we had, which hovered right around 0.4% of new vehicles in the central Ohio region. We call it not just the city of Columbus, but the uh, seven contiguous counties in the very heart of Ohio. Um, we have, uh, you know, 0.4% adoption rate there around 2016. So our goal we set uh, at about um, uh, 1.8% really was derived from a target that we had of basically just 3,200 new EVs sold in the region over this three year period. So then we went back and converted that to an adoption rate and said that if we hit this 1.8% at any one point in the, any one quarter in the program, then we've reached our goal. And you can see that we were able to do that with a lot of help from uh, incentives and things like that there in quarter seven of, of 20, uh, 2018. So then, uh, um, or the last quarter of 2018. So then if you look, uh, you can kind of see how we've dropped off and then uh, kind of gradually increased back up there uh, to, to be able to uh, get at a higher adoption rate over time. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, uh, one thing that I wanted to drive home on this whole thing here is that uh, considerable progress is made, uh, not just by the city of Columbus alone. We could not have done uh, all of this anywhere near this by ourselves. So having all these different partnerships in place, we were able to, to do a lot. Uh, upper left-hand corner there, as far as the smart meters being installed by AEP, who was one of our major partners, we brought on board the local cab company, Yellow Cab of Columbus, and they are working now to, to try to move their whole fleet over to electric vehicles. They have about 200 taxis. And uh, then also, you know, looking at some of the other items here, but really a, a, a big portion of this is if you look at the uh, dealer engagement and all the ride and drives and the efforts that we did there helped us get to our uh, above 3,200 goals. You can see there that in the lower right-hand corner, that we were able to influence uh, 3,458 people to buy an EV in that uh, three-year time span. So we, we were very happy that we exceeded that goal that we set forth. Um, next slide then, please. Uh, so basically, you know, like I said, we had a lot of people help. Uh, we had um, a consultant on board, not just the Columbus Partnership working in the consumer adoption realm, but we brought a consultant on board to help us with our charging design and overseeing construction and things like that. So I really wanted to bring uh, Scott Jaffe from GPD Group in and kind of let him lead you through some of the, the uh, details on what we did in, in the uh, area of charging. So Scott. Thanks, bud. Um, just a quick introduction. Uh, so I'm a project manager with GPD Group. Um, we're a full service engineering and architecture firm and uh, the city of Hyderson to assist with uh, EV charging installations and some of the uh, program management tasks during the grant, um, such as budget tracking and grant reporting. Uh, for this webinar, I'm gonna be running through the uh, city's charging efforts to date. Um, before I go in depth on uh, some of these charging items, uh, I just wanna give everyone a heads up. I'm not gonna be going into any basic definitions or nomenclatures uh, with regards to EV charging, such so like the levels of charging or types of ports. Um, if you want to learn more about any of these basics or any of the uh, charging infrastructure work discussed today, um, we have quite a few articles on the Smart Columbus Playbook. Um, it's a website where we've put up a lot of the work we've done to date, and it'll even go in more detail than I go into today. So it's a great resource uh, if you're looking for more information. All right, so into charging. Uh, back when this program started three years ago, um, we were trying to develop goals for each priority. So when it came to EV charging, uh, the 925 number um, you saw on the previous slide was really just the sum of the goals of each category uh, of charging that were included with the program. Um, in order to get an idea of the scale of the charging that was needed starting out, um, Smart Columbus reached out to the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, which I'm just going to call them NREL uh, for the rest of the webinar. Um, 
and they were able to take our consumer adoption goal and um, correlated with the number of expected EVs on the road in the region, they were able to do an in-depth analysis on uh, the existing EV and charging markets uh, in order to forecast the level, quantity, and locations of chargers needed in the region by the end of 2019. So ultimately, the end result from their report um, indicated that we needed approximately 400 level two plugs at multi-unit dwellings and 350 level two plugs at non-residential locations. Um, and at the time, this was support to support a total of 5,300 electric vehicles on the road. So that would be including the existing ones on the road in 2016 and any added up through 2019. Um, and for their definition, the non-residential locations referred to both public and workplace charging. So we took this baseline goal um, and we, we looked at each category of charging. Um, and even though we started with this, ultimately there was a few other considerations we had to take into account for determining where our goals would be versus what the report showed. We had to take a look at funding options during the grant period, uh, regional demand for charging, um, the way project schedules would work out uh, between all the different stakeholders involved, and then uh, utility regulation. And um, I'm sure Mark will be able to go into a little bit more on AEP side. Uh, so now we have the uh, 2016 existing charging infrastructure map. Um, so once NROS analysis and goals were established, we were, we were ready to begin the process of citing charging locations in the region. Um, step one is to map the region, which we're showing here. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go back one. I'll, uh, I'll jump on that slide in a second. Thank you. Um, so this map in particular, the blue chargers are level two and the yellow are DC fast chargers. Um, we borrowed NREL's approach into mapping this by using the U.S. Department of Energy's online uh, alternative fuels data center. Um, they have a alternative fueling station locator within the site, and it includes map and filtering options such as location, fuel type, charger lever, level, and connector type. We essentially just applied the filters we wanted, and then we could actually export the data um, directly into a CSV file and import it directly into GIS. Um, so, and if you're looking for an alternative to the AFDC site, which is the, would be the government side, um, there's also PlugShare. PlugShare tends to be more up to date um, due to their check-in features where users post uh, when they've used the charger and checking that everything was working properly. Um, we use it as a supplement to the AFDC data uh, by comparing the maps and seeing where chargers weren't showing up uh, on AFDC that were shown on PlugShare and we just manually added them in. Um, you can, I think there is also the option to purchase plug share data. We didn't feel like we needed to um, for this program. Uh, next slide. So the process for identifying public charging locations. Uh, after mapping those existing locations, the next step was to figure out where additional charging should go. Um, as part of the NREL report, EV trip origins and destinations were analyzed to establish some baseline travel behavior. For the trip origins, uh, the data looked to see where existing EV owners resided based on vehicle registration data from IHS Market and the State uh, Bureau of Motor Vehicles. For trip destinations, um, they used traffic analysis zones from our local uh, Regional Planning Commission, or MORPSI in this case, and uh, NRIX data, which to my understanding is cell phone data uh, using GPS. Um, and they were used to track uh, trip destinations to see where those EV drivers were going. Um, destinations varied, but in terms of density, most of the trips were within central Columbus, specifically in downtown, short North Grandview and Ohio State. Um, with that data, then uh, Columbus was able to provide parking meter revenue data, um, specifically in downtown Short North and Grandview to get an idea of where the most popular parking spots were. And they were able to use that information. If you wanted to do curbside charging in a popular area, you could put them at either like the medium or high revenue spaces to really uh, get some use out of them. 
In terms of type of charging, um, the initial focus uh, was level two, given the lower cost of entry, easier installation and simpler utility setup compared to DC fast charging. Um, when we did look at DC fast charging uh, to identify a location, uh, we specifically looked at power availability, demand charge mitigation options, and if the location was near a freeway exit uh, or shopping or restaurants nearby, just because of some of the unique demands uh, from DC fast charging. And then prioritizing uh, charging locations, um, we, did, we added a few additional items to our siting map uh, in order to kind of help nail down some site locations. We added the office locations for workplaces with at least 500 employees. Um, that tied directly into uh, some work with the accelerator partners, which we discussed later. But we had great connections with uh, the larger employees and uh, employers in central Ohio. And then we added the taxi cab waypoints. Um, a local cab company here was uh, heavily involved in the Smart Columbus program. Um, and so we wanted to include their waypoints because they were looking to utilize DC fast charging that was built into uh, the Columbus network. We added code of bus stops. Um, as part of the USDOT work, there's actually uh, charters being put in at specific bus stops. Um, and we can discuss that a little more later. Uh, and then we also added major grocery and shopping retailers. Uh, many of them were already adding charging uh, through their own partnerships with charging companies, um, but they also tend to be some of the highest uh, utilized in travel to areas. So now once we have the map completely built out, um, the charging working group met to rank potential locations based on additional local knowledge uh, using criteria such as expected usage, cost, critical need, potential partners and uh, nearby attractions. So on the next slide, we have, uh, we have the updated map, including the recommendations. So this includes NREL's priority recommendations on top of the existing 2016 network. The red marker denotes level two charging locations and the green are DC fast charger locations. Uh, we can opt to the next slide. And then this map is showing our uh, actual 2020 deployment uh, to date versus that the previous slide, which had the uh, proposed locations. So something to note on this map, the level two chargers added are the light blue markers and then the DC fast chargers that were added since 2016 are the yellow markers. Um, I think it's important to note in this map specifically both we have increased density in the central uh, Columbus area. And then um, there's also some level two and DC fast chargers installed in more critical locations that were further away that are needed to connect commuters and travelers from outside the city. Um, so that DC fast charger in Lancaster, some of the level two chargers um, kind of near Newark along 161. And then a lot of those chargers uh, further Northwest um, they all really start to provide some connections, even for people traveling between uh, Cleveland and Cincinnati um, and those kind of trips. Um, it'll really start to connect the network through the region. Um, moving forward, um, I, I, it's my understanding, I think there's still ongoing installations occurring as part of the AEP charging program. And I'll let Mark uh, kind of discuss that in more detail. And then, um, the level two charging program administered by the Ohio EPA with BW settlement funds is currently receiving applications for projects. And I think they're actually due this month. So we do still have a lot on board for the region and it's exciting to see um, that moving forward. Um, you know, something to keep in mind, although the city was shy to own public chargers during the grant program, even as a part of this process, they now have two locations where they're looking to apply for VW settlement funds for level two charging. Uh, one location is a parking garage on the Scioto Peninsula and the other is uh, the new Columbus Crew Stadium. Um, they'll actually have 700 parking spaces and they're looking to do about 20% EV readiness, which is about 140 spaces and possibly another five to 10% um, with actual chargers installed. So that can be 35 to 70 chargers. Um, so there's definitely some bright spots looking forward here on the uh, public charging uh, efforts within the city. Um, before I move into mud charging, Bud, do you have anything you want to add with regards to uh, public charging efforts on the smart Columbus side? 
Um, we can talk about that a little bit more later, but yeah, Scott's right that uh, originally the city of Columbus didn't really want to own any chargers, but the need is, is really great, as you can see on, on Scott's map there. If you drill down, especially in the downtown area, uh, you know, it's really going to be helpful for us to have those level two chargers in those two critical city garages. So yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks, bud. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, multi-unit development charging. And um, we're going to focus on the, uh, this is specific to the city program. Um, AEP had um, their own program built in. I'll let them go into that more. Um, so for MUD overall, quite a large portion of the population doesn't own a single family home, but 80% of charging is typically done at home. In order to provide that residential option for apartment and condo owners, uh, developers should be aware of and provide charging options to their residents. Um, in order to incentivize MUD EV charging installations, Smart Columbus launched uh, a rebate program to provide the partial funding uh, for MUD developments to install EV charging facilities. Um, Clean Fuels Ohio assisted in the administration of the MUD rebates and really did uh, most of the legwork. For those who don't know, Clean Fuels Ohio is Ohio's uh, Clean Cities Coalition designated through the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, if you're looking for assistance with understanding and developing EV charging programs and policies in your area, it is definitely worth reaching out to your local uh, Clean Cities Coalition location. Um, they made this process uh, much easier and they already had the connections in the region to uh, really move this thing forward. Um, so the basics of the program done on the Smart Columbus side, um, it was available to developers in the seven county Columbus metro area. Um, and the main requirement uh, is it was set up as a rebate. Um, so they had to apply for funding and provide supporting data of that they followed the requirements they had to provide budgets, a bunch of other information that had to essentially get signed off on before they could get um, paid after uh, completing the installations. Um, ultimately, uh, seven developers were awarded rebates um, in various parts of the city, and uh, it ended up being 21 total sites. We can go on the next slide. Um, this is a timeline we developed as part of our uh, final reporting efforts. It kind of goes through the big picture of how the Smart Columbus MUD program um, kind of played out. I think a big item early in the program on here is when it shows we align the Smart Columbus MUD rebate program and AEP Ohio EV charging station incentive program. So these programs were being developed at the same time, but separately just because of uh, kind of the timing of everything. And what, what happened is we released the MUD, uh, the Smart Columbus program, uh, but then AP, I think shortly released theirs after and we realized pretty quickly what was happening is people were choosing one over the other and we really wanted them to benefit everyone. So we adjusted, uh, we checked with AP and then adjusted our MUD program so that they could line up and both could be used at the same time. Uh, and I think it helped a lot in keeping people interested in applying for the program. Um, and you'll see we did two uh, funding rounds um, they were both pretty popular. Um, sometimes people had, like applicants had to move to the second funding round because their projects weren't ready. Um, just thinking about how developers do their programs. Um, if they're in the middle, to, the middle of constructing a development, um, they're trying to fit these kind of things within their project schedule. So um, there did need to be some flexibility in how these were designed. Uh, a, few thing, a few things you'll notice in the pictures. Um, these are all using a public style charger. So they all have screens um, and likely any kind of mud charger is gonna use that. They're, they would only be using a fleet style charger if um, the developer was pretty much choosing to take on all the costs. So likely you're gonna get a little bit more expensive chargers uh, just because the need to have a public interface. You also see varying options of cord management or lack thereof. Um, we kept that pretty open. Um, we just had some fundamentals that we wanted them to follow, but otherwise we did want to provide some flexibility to them. Um, I think, uh, and you also see, I guess, there's pedestal and wall mounted versions. I mean, we really didn't try to constrict any of that on the developers. Um, they need to make this stuff fit to their projects. Um, so I think I just recommend being flexible in some of that setup um, and how they decide to design their sites. Uh, next slide. 
All right, so this was uh, kind of a shortened version of the overall process for uh, implementing a MUD rebate program. Um, and Clean Fuels Ohio really developed and ran with this. Um, I'll go a little bit into what they were trying to do, but I'll keep it pretty, uh, pretty basic at this point. I think that first step was uh, really developing a structure um, or outline of a program um, and kind of what are the general requirements you want to have. Um, and then you can get into more details of uh, the specifics of the charging as you kind of, after you build out that outline. A big part of developing the outline though is doing some outreach with the development community. You have to see uh, how much they're educated on. Is there a demand from them? What are they looking for from outside help? Um, in terms of both funding and education or how much work help do they want from uh, an outside entity. Um, in terms of uh, the application selection period, um, I think that was kept pretty open, but we did want to have some set dates um, and make that pretty clear so that if people didn't think they could get stuff done in a round, we let them know, hey, there will be another round. So just be ready to go the next time. Um, in contracting with developers, it is important that you try to do those as quickly as possible. Um, it provides an incentive for the contractor to keep their projects moving and uh, it prevents too many people getting pushed back. Um, so it's something to stay on top of. Um, on the installation side, most of that work is gonna be covered by contractors um, and with some uh, input from the utility, but it does not hurt if you're uh, running a program like this just to be a connection point with resources to the city or utilities uh, for the developers, just so they feel like they have um, some additional help if they run into some project issues. Um, uh, on the inspection and promotion side, it was a requirement that Clean Fuels had to inspect every installation um, and take site photos for confirmation that everything was um, installed and up and running. And those photos ultimately got used as promotion um, on items on our playbook and being able to reach out and um, share that these uh, chargers were put in and get people interested in using them. Um, and then for the data, um, Definitely one of the requirements for these programs is data. It's one of the reasons to have them actually is to really start to understand charging behavior better. Um, and I believe we required three years of shared data and it actually turned out really well. Most used charge point for their chargers and we were able to have them sign a form and it allowed us direct access to the charger data through charge points um, online dashboard so that the developers didn't have to constantly find data for us on a quarterly basis. Um, and it also allowed ingestion directly into the Smart Columbus operating system through the USDOT program. Uh, next slide. Um, so for the overall uh, rebate objectives um, and design, I covered a little bit of this, but you can see this gets into more details of kind of the nuts and bolts of what we had in here. Um, so we're trying to leverage uh, Paul G. Allen Philanthropy's grant funds. So we said at the beginning, just based on budget, $3,500 per plug or space. We wanted to make sure developers were providing some kind of match and then some minimum uh, charging space requirements, depending on the size of the uh, de uh, development. We tried to, for the most part, enforce the six months project completion. Um, we did, we tried to be flexible with a few that ran into issues, some related to COVID. Um, there's just going to be things that come up that are not, uh, you can't stick to that. Um, and then just how the timing of when the project ends. Um, so try to give some hard deadlines and be flexible when it's needed. Um, on the installation and ownership process, it definitely helps uh, the developer to have a clear understanding of what they need to provide and what they are taking care of on their own and what has to get shared back to the program. Um, and so these were just the steps uh, that they needed to take and provide back just to make sure they were doing their installation properly. Um, and I'll go into, uh, I guess one lesson learned was the signage and stenciling. And the more specific, if you want to be more specific, you can provide that and it makes it easier. They don't have to think about what has to go in there, but the, uh, the charging company should also be able to provide some insight into uh, signage and stenciling on site. The 30 days free and reasonable monthly fee afterwards, um, it does seem like it's, there's general practice to keep charging free at least for a little while. And I, I think a big thing we're noticing on comments uh, on the charging dashboard is that make sure you communicate the switch over from free to monthly uh, fee because that is a quick way to upset your residents. 
even if it's a small amount of money, they don't like being surprised. And it did happen for a few sites. So just keep that in mind. Um, encourage widespread deployment. Um, we were able to get some deployment into uh, surrounding counties um, and that may take uh, more direct outreach to developers and uh, locations further away. Um, but it's, it's worthwhile um, to really increase the education side too. And then learning charging behavior, which is a big part of this program, all of their, all the charging has to have the ability to record data and has to be shareable. Um, the utility control for demand response, we didn't need it right now, but setting it up that way allows uh, for uh, future flexibility on the utility side, um, if and when uh, demand response and some of the other tools they have uh, become available. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so this is just the summary of the program uh, on the Smart Columbus side of the uh, mud charters installed. So you can see, I mean, we have a lot downtown, uh, but then it did spread out a good bit to the suburbs uh, heading north there. Um, so we had a good mix and it's nice to see a variety of sites. So it's, we wanted it to spread out uh, and some developers is a solid number. Um, we certainly would like to get more. And I think, um, as time goes on here, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, because it is so easy when building a development to do at least EV readiness. So as the city gets a policy going, that'll, uh, I think there'll be a big change there. Uh, next slide. And so just uh, final lessons learned. Um, we went back and forth about doing these things as a grant program at a rebate. I think it provides flexibility to the developer on their schedules, uh, getting that money up front and then a little bit less administrative uh, oversight, but at the same time, I think that ends up, you have to end up being a little more rigorous on the installation or uh, on the inspection side to make sure you're getting exactly everything you're looking for. Um, leveraging local partnerships. I think this is definitely about using all the, the tools you have available to reach out to developers and uh, anyone else who might be able to assist uh, on the charging side. And then finally, level two instead of level one. When we originally started, we allowed for either level one or level two. And honestly, there was no interest in level one and it's just not a necessity. Developers can do that on their own, just putting outlets in a garage. Uh, it's just not, we don't need that uh, as an option anymore. So definitely look, start at level two and don't worry about level one at this point. But do you have anything else uh, for mud charging? Yeah, I do, Scott, thanks. Uh, just some, somebody asked a question uh, about, you know, did we have any new facilities that were being built that we added to and the top picture there actually shows a parking garage that was under construction when they wanted to put this charger in so that was one of the challenges is that they wanted to uh to take advantage of this rebate during our program and not push it off too too far they put a charger in here i know they said they had an intent then to add additional ones later on inside I'm not sure if they've got to that yet, but uh, so that's the thing is you're, you gotta realize that as you have a limited time frame here, especially if you have a limited time frame, that when you wanna work with a developer, you have to be flexible on their, on their construction schedule too, especially if things are going in new. So yeah, thanks Scott. Thanks bud. All right, next slide. Um, so for fleet charging with the city, I'm gonna, this will be quick, but uh, I think it's important because there was quite a bit of work put into this. Um, so the city uh, of Columbus specifically purchased 200 fleet EVs as part of the grant program and we had to provide charging for that. Um, so to date, the city has 151 level two uh, fleet charging ports operational. There's another eight under construction and probably close to being finished. And then another uh, eight planned uh, in design right now, which we're working on. So they're looking at about 160 level two fleet ports at 18 sites uh, for about 200 vehicles. What's nice is some of those vehicles are plug-in hybrids, so not all of them will need a charger all the time and they can share as needed. Um, so overall considerations and lesson learned uh, from fleet charging with the city. Um, obviously vehicle needs, which is what I was just talking about. If you're all BEVs, there's a chance you may need a charger for every vehicle depending on how they're used. Whereas if you get some plug-in hybrids, you start to increase the flexibility of uh, how much charging you need uh, for vehicles and parking assignments. 
Um, internal city project development systems really goes to schedule. Uh, same with uh, legislation timelines is how are, what are the systems in place now at the city or wherever you're working um, in terms of permitting and project schedules because likely those aren't gonna change just because it's sweet charging or uh, there's something special going on. Often it's easier to use the systems in place and maybe modify them slightly. Um, so just keep that in mind in terms of project timelines. Um, development of construction standards and specifications. Uh, we, as part of doing the design for these, develop, had developed and provided some standards and specs. And we also provided details uh, in plan development um, as part of all this, but it's something that's gonna be needed, but not just for fleet charging, but any charging that cities are gonna put in, um, if they're gonna bid out plans or anything like that. So it's something that I think needs to be thought about up front um, and it'll continually be worked on throughout these projects. Um, and then coordination with vehicle procurement schedule and available funding sources. Those are actually probably two of the most important items for this. Um, vehicles can be ordered fairly quickly and shipped fairly quickly. So charging has to be known well ahead of time so that we need, we essentially need to know where these vehicles are going to be parked. Um, and if BEVs or plug-in hybrids, um, can be up to like three to months to a year in advance of uh, the vehicles being purchased. Um, in order for the timing of delivery to work out with the chargers being online. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest things to figure out up front is coordinating those schedules. Um, and then the final item on here is uh, the city is anticipating receiving about $85,000 of funding through AAP Ohio's EV charging station incentive program by allowing EV charging uh, for city employee personal vehicles. This wasn't done at every site, but there's a handful of sites where instead of putting in the uh, fleet charging model, we actually put in the public charging model. So then um, they could apply for kind of like a dual use uh, workplace and fleet charging. Um, I'll let Bud go into that a little more um, here in a second, but uh, it was just a unique way to utilize AP funding and get cities, uh, the city employees to be able to use uh, charging for their vehicles. So it's not just for fleet vehicles. Yeah, so we had some, uh, I'd say, some important lessons learned on the fleet program, too. You know, we had some issues here and there, but I think it can be summed up really into one lesson is that you're working with a lot of different departments throughout the city. Um, and some of them are, you have the range anxiety fears already. Some of them, uh, um, you know, have space, parking space concerns, obviously. But the biggest thing is that that you uh, develop a fully developed scope and that it's shared out and that people have a good understanding of, of what's going on, what's being built and that type of thing. So I think that's a good takeaway for that. Um, also here in the immediate future, we're uh, the site that you see there on that map, we're putting in charging at, the, uh, at a refuse facility and uh, we're actually putting in a, a city refuse electric truck uh, into service. And somebody asked a question about commercial trucks at this point, we haven't really gotten into there. It's definitely on our radar, especially as uh, we want to try to, to make spaces like that available. So we really haven't done anything yet other than with the research that comes with that. And uh, if you're not aware, Argonne National Labs is doing considerable research on the megawatts that it's going to take to, uh, to be able to handle not just the uh, electric buses and things like that that are going in, but the uh, commercial use of this. We've also worked quite a bit with uh, Ohio Department of Transportation on strategically placing charters, not just in Central Ohio, but especially for range anxiety, you know, around the state, like in parks and at rest areas and things like that. So. Those are a lot of our next steps that we're looking at to, as we uh, as we reach out as far as charging goes. Um, and then, then on, also on the next slide, as we get into workplace charging a little bit, um, it's interesting. Somebody asked a question about the uh, challenges that we ran into as far as our experience center. And so I just kind of gave a quick answer there with a couple of uh, points, but one a uh, really important point is that even though we were right in the front door of Columbus and hundreds of thousands of people are able to come through there, uh, parking was at a premium right there too. So we really had a hard time trying to find the uh, infrastructure available in the parking space to match that to be able to put an EV charger there close to our experience center. So uh, it's kind of ironic that uh, this is about charging and that was our one uh, biggest challenge there or big challenge there. I think Jennifer, you could probably weigh in on a couple more challenges with the experience center there, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, so for those of you not familiar with the Smart Commons Experience Center, it is our headquarters, but it's also a space that is open to the public where anyone can come in seven days a week and learn about uh, electric vehicles and most importantly, take a test drive. We have um, at any given time four to six EVs on loan to us from our partner dealers, which made it a really incredible, indelible experience to help us teach people about uh, electric vehicles. Also, we had chargers right there on site, so you could kind of see how easy it is to charge a vehicle. I'd say one more challenge to think about is just how do you go about staffing it, acknowledging you want to be open when people are available. Our team is, you know, moving the uh, We've moving things forward for the entire program during the nine to five. So how do you be there on evenings and weekends? And because we were in the big uh, festival area of our community, how do you staff up when you have the Jazz and Ridge Festival bringing thousands of people to your doorstep? Uh, really, the revelation we came to is when we partnered up with Drive Electric Columbus, the local affinity group. They helped augment our capacity for very large events and on weekends to uh, educate people about EVs and why they love their cars. So more about the Experience Center is available on the Smart Columbus Playbook if you check that out on our website. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so real quick, just about workplace charging. Uh, I don't want to get into more detail that's already been covered in, in the uh, prior um, webinar, but if you look at item three there, installed charging infrastructure, um, we have dozens of partners like Chase Bank and so many others that installed charging infrastructure. Um, so if you go to the next slide there, just want to cover, you know, some of the uh, locations around town that actually took advantage of uh, AEP's rebates that I'm going to just let Mark talk about. But uh, as you can see, we have 394 ports deployed uh, with that program. Um, next slide. You know, the city of Columbus wants to, to uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, work with the partnership and help people understand workplace charging. A lot of information is on our website that we were able to get from Electrification Coalition on guidance for that. So you don't just kind of throw that over in a company's lap. Um, next slide. You can see that, um, you know, we've put in not only fleet charging, but we are going to use that for workplace charging as well at four different sites. So we were able to, uh, to use the AP rebate for that. And that's going to uh, help us study, you know, working with trying to uh, work with City of Columbus employees and, and getting them to purchase EVs on their own by having a place to charge. And then also having a policy for that is pretty important for a city uh, because, you know, if basically fuel isn't free uh, by the taxpayers. So we want to make sure that either they're charged a monthly fee or they pay for the power. Uh, that's kind of important to the city of Columbus as well. Um, next slide then. Uh, Going to turn it over to Mark and uh, last but not least in our lineup here. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, thanks, bud. And uh, appreciate uh, a few minutes with everybody today. I'm Mark Barron, uh, director of our business development team at AP Ohio. And and I will keep this fairly short because um, I do want to get to uh, if, there's, if there's questions out there. But, but as part of the program that, that both Scott and Bud have talked about, AP Ohio went to the commission, the, the utilities commission here, and got a four-year pilot program approved for uh, customer incentives uh, rebates. And the target was for 300 level two uh, charging stations and 75 uh, DC fast charging stations. Um, initially it was bucketed into three categories, public, and really those top two lines there are both public and that there was a distinction made between public at government sites and public charging that was not at government sites. And you can see that the percentages and the caps uh, for both level two and fast chargers were a bit different depending on whether they were uh, government sites or not. And then there was a workplace charging and a multifamily uh, charging. And so those three categories were originally targeted with 50% uh, of all of the incentives in mind to go to workplace, 30% uh, to the public and 20% to multifamily. That was the original design. And then within both, 10% uh, of each was supposed to go to um, low income uh, you know, areas. Um, that that uh, requirement remains in effect. Um, one of the best elements of this program, one of the best things that, that the folks did that designed it was set up with the commission and, and the, you know, other interested parties, um, sort of a midpoint review of the program. So at some point in the, in the four year period, go back and sort of level set and, and 
propose adjustments to the program uh, along the way. And so we did that. And so about maybe a year and a half into it, we went back with the commission and we tweaked the parameters of the program. And one of the big things we did was remove that 50% workplace, 30% public, 20% multifamily uh, requirements and sort of let the market um, you know, di dictate there. And, and one of the reasons for that is because the incentive percentages were different, you know, customers were uh, rightfully, you know, I'll say chasing the higher incentive amount, right? So if you're gonna put a charging station in a grocery store parking lot, is that a public charging station? or is that a workplace charging station for the folks that work there, right? And so folks were, were looking for what's the higher percentage there and so that the targets, you know, sort of became a bit skewed. Uh, we were able to, uh, you know, modify the program that way and that's worked out really well. We were also able to add some bus uh, parameters, uh, the ability to include bus charging into the program as well as uh, fleet charging, neither of which were in the sort of, uh, in the original design. Um, so then it came to, well, okay, so now that we have our program set up, how are we going to market it? How are we going to inform folks? And quite frankly, a lot of that was done with all the external parties that are, that are here, City of Columbus and, and Smart Columbus and Clean Fuels Ohio and many others were really much of the marketing for the program. And, and then certainly AEP Ohio through the, the numerous customer relationships and groups that we have that manage those customer relationships that's where the communication about the program really, um, you know, took off. If you want to go to the next slide, um, part of the requirement for the program is that we have to collect four years of data and we have to report that data back to the commission on a periodic basis. So here's a snapshot of where we are as of May, which is the last time we went to the commission. And, and as Scott mentioned earlier, you know, there are still some installations going on. This is a nine and a half million dollar program only about 3 million of that has been paid out to date. So two thirds of all the dollars for the program are still projects in progress being built. And as they get finalized, those incentives will be paid. And the, and the data that becomes particularly interesting and, and what much of us are interested in is, you know, what will we learn as Scott mentioned, what will we learn around charging behavior, around costs, around pricing and rates um, around planning and, and putting charging stations in the right places. One thing about our program was it was very much first come, first serve. So it was not uh, uh, a way of getting all the charging in necessarily all the right places, but, but it was a great first step. Um, and, and so certainly more steps to come. And then lastly, on the last page, um, there's been a lot of maps shown today. Uh, this is a, another one. Of, of the charging stations that have been implemented uh, through our program. You can see uh, on the left-hand side there, that's a, that's a blow up of most of Ohio, but you can see that most of it is still within central Ohio. So our goal, and, and we have um, you know, proposed another program because we wanna see the momentum from this program continue forward, is proposing uh, more of the same. You'll notice there was nothing on the residential side here. So we're certainly you know, advocating that that needs to be a, a piece of the puzzle. And then we want to see this spread, not just to, to the metro area, but to, you know, the other parts of, of the state as well. So I will stop there um, and I think turn it back to Bud and, and hopefully we can get to some questions. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'm just going to zip through these slides here just for the sake of time. You know, basically just look there, you can see that City of Columbus has made a difference here locally, uh, being the um, you know the growth that we've had for Chargers there compared to all the other cities. So just taking a step back, looking at what we've done, study what we've done is important. And then we've got the other goals. If you move to the next slide, you know one of our important things that we really want to highlight, as well as other cities, and learn about is is just to how to deal with the lack of EV charger deployments in the low income neighborhoods, and try to tackle that issue. So that and, and a whole lot more uh, that we hope to be able to share in the future. But again, I just want to try to answer some, some of the questions, Jennifer, if that's all right for us to move on to that. Yes, let's jump right into the Q&A. And Mark, I'll keep you on the hot seat. Um, question coming in from Joey, has the total budget for the program, has it been fulfilled? If not, how much is left and what's the timeline for new applications? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you would go back to my slide, 
the third of uh, maybe the second of my slides, the one before the map. Yep, that one, perfect. So if you look on the, on the, I guess the bar charts there, so on the right side of each of those two stacked bar charts, so in the blue and maroon there, um, for our fast chargers, we've right now committed to 5.6 of the 5.8 million. I'm gonna, oh, I'm watching your arrow up to the top left there. Um, 5.6 of the 5.8, and so I'll say we're fully reserved um, we're just waiting for some of the projects to be fin finalized. We've left ourselves a little bit of wiggle room there just in case the some of the projects come in uh, more costly than anticipated. We'll have that room, um, but we have a, a short waiting list for uh, for projects to sort of backfill in to make sure that we hit that, that the full amount. And then on the right, the, the far right hand side there for the level two program, uh, we've, we've allocated 3.5 of the 3.7 million so i'll say we're fully allocated there as well with within the wiggle room that, that we'll uh, use up uh, ultimately as well Great. but if folks and are Mark, still interested to... oh go ahead uh, one more question for you how did you identify low-income multifamily complexes for the installation of charging yeah we did it by um like census uh, blocks um and so it was a, it was a definition of the location and whether or not that location fell within that uh, that block or that you know that map. It was not an evaluation of like each customer, right? It was not an evaluation of their financial situation, whether or not they qualified or not. It was simply a matter of whether they fell into the uh, you know the low income areas uh, as mapped out. Great. Uh, and here's a question from Andrew: Which charging companies are participating in the program for supplying level two? So for the AP Ohio program, we had a list of approved equipment and, and a list of approved network providers. And the three network providers are ChargePoint, GreenLot, and EV Connect. Uh, and one more question that we have coming in about MUD, but I'll turn it over to uh, you, Bud, and Scott, because it came in during your presentation. Did you give the multifamily property owner the option for pricing with the EVSC? It, for example, as a fee within their um, their monthly payment or a dollar per, per kilowatt, kilowatt hour? Yes, we yeah. did. Uh, yeah, we, uh, it was what Scott, three quarters of a equivalent of uh, a gallon of gasoline was the maximum, but we required a month free initially. Yeah, so I think the uh, in the first round, I think we did. It was a month, and it was the yeah the the reasonable fee max was defined as being no greater than three quarters of cost per mile of mid grain gasoline for a comparable vehicle. And then it looks like in round two, we upped it to ninety days free um, to give some more time for people to learn about the chargers and get to using them. Yeah, the details on that, even the rebate application, I believe, is on the Smart Columbus website. Just look under the MUD documents. Great. Mark, one more question as we wrap the Q&A. A, a follow-up question on the low-income census tract. How is the uptake in those low-income areas? Um, we'd always like it to be more. Um, we, will hit, we will definitely hit the the 10% requirement for both within uh, within the level two and within the fast charging. I think at last I looked at it, we were at um, I think 11% for one of those two categories and like 19% for the other. Um, so we will hit that, but you know, that's an area as the utility, we, we'd always like that number to be higher. Um, and so we'll, we'll work in the, in the follow on programs and the follow on efforts, uh, you know, with everyone here to, uh, try and target those those areas yet again. Great. Mark, thanks so much, along with Scott, Bud, and Natalia for joining us and sharing about the program. Again, if you have questions about the program, we encourage you to visit AccelerateYourCity.com. Again, it's a digital capstone of our program where you can learn more about all five areas of the program that Bud referenced, um, including our charging uh, installation. Thanks so much for joining us today. We encourage you to visit Accelerate Your City to learn more. Uh, about the program. Thank you. All right. Thanks.